<laughs> oh, you're always learning these things the hard way. Um, so we're going to meet briefly to talk about the preliminary lab reports for the uniform circular motion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to get a printout, bring it into my office with your group, set up a you know, a time, and we'll quickly go through it and I'll look for things. That's what we need to do. I think that's a good thing to do. Uh, and we're doing an experiment this week, I guess. It's probably conservation of energy. Yep. Okay. All right, so we're going to start a new chapter today. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten rid of this word. I just don't, we don't need it at this level. So this is, uh, people would call this linear momentum. Why they call it linear momentum, we'll see. It's not a big deal. I can tell you right now, it's to distinguish it between, it's to distinguish it from angular momentum. So this is straight line momentum. So, so far we've been dealing with, um, you know, we talk about bodies, but we've really been treating them like particles. We don't worry about the body rotating, for example. And we've dealt with one or two. Have we dealt with three bodies? I don't know if we, we can, right? But we're going to make um, a, a leap right now, and we're going to deal with uh, any number of particles. Okay, any, an arbitrary system. This could be a gas, or this should be form, it's a typo. Um, it could be a gas, a solid, or a liquid. So I'll try to remember to remind you of this. This is a very general, we're taking a very general approach here to establish some basic fundamental physics. <clears throat> and a quantity that plays a central role, as, we're, as we'll see, is called the center of mass. You've probably all heard about this. Um, you've probably heard of the center of gravity. Okay, they're not technically the same. They can be different. And um, I think we'll talk about the center of gravity a little bit when we get into gravitation at the, at the end of, near the end of the course. <coughs> so to motivate this center of mass, let's consider two particles. M1 and M2. And we'll assume that M1 is equal to or greater than M2. We're free to assume that. That's, we're still being very general here. And again, just to motivate this, we'll be more rigorous about this in the future, but suppose you have a thin rod, massless rod, negligible mass, between, and it's rigid, between these two masses. Okay, so that's what I've done here. So you have this mass here, this bigger mass here, mass here, neglect the mass of the rod and it's rigid. Where is the balance point? Where does it balance in a gravitational field? Well, you know that it's going to be, not, the center's not gonna work, right? You know that. So it's already getting into the, <laughs> right? Oh, sorry. Okay, these are the same material, it's wood. <laughs> So what's going to happen if I release this? I'm supporting at the center? Yeah, it goes like that. It's going to be somewhere over here. Where do you think it is? Well, we've got a hole here. <laughs> so this is free to move, right? And if I release it from rest, pretty much, okay, it's very sensitive. See, did it go, it's going down a little bit. So, I can adjust this. I shouldn't be doing this. This is going to... Uh, not bad, right? Okay. So, there's going to be some point where it balances. That's the center of mass. Okay, where the where it balances, that's the best thing, I, that's all I can say right now is where it balances. We'll be able to see why this is, we'll be able to prove it with the, um, we'll be able to prove the fact that the balance point here has the property that if you take this mass times this distance, it equals that mass times that distance. Which makes sense, right? 
you know that because this is more massive, this distance is going to be shorter. It turns out, and we'll prove this later in the course when we get into rotational dynamics, that this is the condition that tells you where that balance point is. We just want to assume it right now because we're going to get a lot of mileage out of it, as you'll see. But we'll prove it later on in the course. Um, so we're going to uh, define here the center of mass as the point at which if you uh, balance a system, if you um, s suspend the system in a gravitational field, uniform gravitational field, it balances. It doesn't ex angularly accelerate. Um, so we already did this, this example. Okay, here's another one. Okay, so these, these are two masses that I've attached here. Here's the mid, here's the center point, right? That's where this is called an equal arm balance. It, of course, balances when I suspend it at the center. The center of mass, I can't see this. So the center of mass is going to be somewhere along this, by symmetry, it's going to have to be somewhere along this line. Okay? It may be where that hole is. Okay, but it's got, I know it's got to be here because it's a symmetrical situation. I'm going to upset that by putting these balances. Now this is approximately twice the mass of this. So if I put this here, this mass times this distance, I need to double the distance over here, right? And you can see that this is free to move, it, it balances. So this shows you this condition that I showed here. This is a, a this shows you at least the approximate validity of this condition right here. If I don't do that, if I put it over here, what's going to happen? It goes this way, right? And if I put this over here, now they're both the same distance, but you know what's, you know what's going to happen here, right? They're both at the same distance, and this is heavier, so it's got to do that. Uh, maybe it's best if I get rid of this now. Any questions about this? Okay, so we've got a, but we've got a problem because our definition here of the center of mass, it's almost like you need to know where it is. You know, we want to be able to find the center of mass. We want to be able to have a formula for the center of mass so we can find it. Well, here this is kind of going the opposite way. If we know the center of mass, then it has this property. So we need to come up with a general formula. So. I want you to imagine now, we don't know where the center of mass is. We, haven't, we have an origin. You can put the origin anywhere you want to on this x-axis here. We're just doing it one dimensionally here. We'll generalize it in a moment. So let's say we have the origin over here. It doesn't matter. It's not going to matter. We want to know the position of the center of mass. And it has to conform. It has to be consistent with this fact. With, oops, sorry. It has to be consistent with this fact. So the best way to handle this is actually, I'm just going to give you the formula and then we're going to verify, so show that it's all consistent. So in this box here, this is what does it. All right? And um, this capital M here, we will pretty routinely use that as the total mass that plays a, it's going to play an important role in, our, in the dynamics here, as you'll see. Um, so, let's verify. The first thing, let's, let's, let's consider some special cases. Suppose m1 is equal to zero. Where does the center of mass have to be? It's going to have to be here, right? Does our formula reduce to that? Well, let's see. m1 is equal to zero, so this is gone. What's the total mass? m2. It works. And it also works symmetric in... in um, in the mass in, in M1 and M2 here. It also works for um, M2 being zero, right? Then it's just the, this is going to be gone and M is going to be M1, so it works, it works in those two cases. That's good. What's another case that we can check? <laughs> so when the masses are equal, right? Where's the center of mass have to be by symmetry? In the midpoint, at the midpoint. So does that work? Let's see, when m1 equals m2, 
I can factor these, these out. The total mass is just twice the individual mass, so we get this, that's the midpoint. So that pretty much nails it down, I think. But just to be sure here, there's one more thing we can do that really nails it down, shows that it's right. Nothing stops us from choosing our origin to be at the center of mass. So this is this other perspective, like let's say we know where it is. Let's choose our origin at the center of mass. What's, the, what's this then? What's it going to equal? Zero. Zero. So I can, so I get the fact, what I, in that case, when we choose the origin to be the center of mass, this is going to be zero, I can forget about this, and I get, you can see that if I bring this over here, I get this, and <clears throat> x2 is just d2 in our previous, in the, the diagram above there, and x1 is negative, when I multiply it by a negative sign, it's going to be, it's going to be d1. So we've got our condition. This is, this is equivalent to this balance condition here. So this is the right formula, there's no question about it. Can we general, can we go to three particles? Oh, forget it. That can't be, that can't be done, right? No, it's, it's obvious, right? I mean, even if anybody didn't know any physics or anything, it, well, you have, to, you have to know what plus, you know, addition, as long as you understand addition. How, you, how would you guess this is going to be generalized to three particles? You just add another moment. Engineers call this the um, moment of the mass, the mass times the distance. You're just going to add another one on here. Now, that's going to, of course, th remember, this is going to stay the total mass, so you're going to have to add, make sure you do the total mass. So here's the general formula for the center of mass. And technically, this is a definition, but we've motivated it here. Okay. Yes, sir. So this is assuming that each mass is for all like a straight line, essentially? Yeah, this is one dimension right now. We're going to gen it's easy to generalize, as you'll, as, as you'll see in a moment. Right, this is one dimension right now. So the, everything's on a, in one dimension here, and any number of particles we can, uh, we can handle, so we can use a summation here, it's understood this sum is over all the particles, and here's the mass, and we should, I should have written in there, I should have, you know, we can write that, it should be, I'll add that in here. Okay, so that's in one dimension, how do we go to another dimension? Well, you can see here in, the, in, the, in our definition, there's nothing really special about the x-axis. Now I know we have taken, to motivate this, we've talked about a gravitational field, but you see that there, this is entirely general here. So there's really no distinction between the y and the z-axis here. We might think there is in our head because we've got a gravitational field and would be, but it's not, not going to make any difference here. And this is regarding the, the, our definition here. So we have two other equations for the, um, for the y center of mass. Well, all that's going to be important there is the y values and the z values. So this is the strict definition of the center of mass of a collection of particles in three dimensions. And we can um, unify this we can multiply this by a unit vector, multiply both sides by a unit vector in the i direction, unit vector in the, you know, by i, a unit vector in the x direction, uh, what do we call it? j, a unit vector in the y direction, and then add them all together and we get this. Now this is for a collection of particles. What, um, what if it's a continuous, what if it's, <laughs> What's, where's the center of mass of this? Well, we'll talk about this in a moment. It's got a center of mass. Everything at any moment of time, even if, these, even if it's not a rigid body, there's an instantaneous center of mass. That's what it is. So, can I, our definition is for particles. How do I handle it here? You know, you know the answer to this. It's calculus, right? We imagine splitting it up into a bunch of little tiny masses, and we've got to do this. This will become an integral. Um, now, here's something that authors tend not to get into, but it's, I don't know why not, it's important here. So, 
This applies to any system of particles. This is the center of mass. We will often, often it comes up in here, and that's like the first demonstration, right? A particle technically is something that has very small spatial extent. Um, so again, let's imagine, let's imagine this is a massless rod. So where's the center of mass of this, this ball? Right in the center, by symmetry, right? What about this one? Again, right in the center. So if I'm going to calculate where the center of mass here is, I'm naturally going to imagine this mass to be concentrated at center of mass, and this to be, and then do the calculation. And we'll do such a calculation in a moment. But it's obvious, but I think it's worth stating because it it's gets used so much. So here's a, this is kind of wordy, but this is, uh, so suppose we have a system that's composed of subs, this, this is a subsystem. It's composed of a bunch of particles. This is composed of a bunch of particles, right? If I know the center of mass of one subsystem and the other subsystem, I can get the total center of mass. It's, it's obvious. I just imagine all this mass concentrated at its center of mass, and, and then I'm off, then I have, I've reduced it to a two-particle system. So that's what I'm saying right here. So let's suppose we have two subsystems, right? And this immediately generalizes to any. So this is one subsystem, and that's one subsystem. And we're neglecting the mass of the rod. We can easily include that later. It's obvious and it's easy to prove that the center, now we, we essentially have a two-particle system. We just find the moments of each of the particles. We imagine the subsystem one, all of its mass to be concentrated at center mass. And we just do what we did before, but it, we just, it's only for two particles here. So I think this is, is pretty, it's self, almost self-evident, and it's, it's easy to prove. So here's an, a, a good example of that. It's, it's similar to this example right here, the Earth-Moon system. So now this is not to scale. You see this is the radius of the Earth, and this is the moon, the center of the moon is, from the center of the Earth is 60 Earth radii. So it's not to scale, right? So let's ask, where's the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system? Hmm. So it's, if we imagine <laughs> this system in a uniform gravitational field, it would be you know, where, where we would, um, what the balance point would be. That's the physical way of looking. How do we calculate it? Well, this is a one, it's, it's, whoops. The center of mass has to lie along this line, for one thing, by symmetry. But you don't really need to worry about that because what are we going to imagine all of this mass? What are we going to do? We know the center of mass here. We're assuming that Earth is a perfectly spherical. It, it deviates a little bit from that. There's an equatorial bulge, right? We actually demonstrated that. Remember the wire bands? Is that going to change the... Uh, that doesn't change the center of mass. is still in the geometric center. But some of you may know that the Earth is actually pear-shaped. I think it's bigger in the... Is it the southern hemisphere? I think it is. You guys know this? Um, it's a very... That's a very small effect. You know how they found that out? It was only discovered in, um, when satellite, in the 1960s or something like that, when people started putting up satellites. The orbits weren't exactly, the orbits were not exactly what they calculated. And they were able to infer that the Earth has a very slight, I'm greatly exaggerating it here, but it has a slight pear shape. We're going to neglect that, okay? The center of mass is at the center here. The center of mass of this system is there. So I have these two subsystems. I'm going to reduce this to do this problem. When I look at this, I see this. I see a two-particle system. So now, where's the balance point? Well, it's going to be over here somewhere to the left of center because the Earth is more massive. And how do we calculate it? Well, we use our formula. So here's the formula. Do I have that next? This is going to be the formula for the two-particle system. There's the total mass. I'm using, you know, E for Earth and M for Moon. Uh, yeah. And now how do, we, how do we calculate this? We have to come up with, we have to assign an origin. It doesn't matter where the origin is. 
So we might as well make it something that's convenient. And the reasonable thing to do here is to put the origin right at the Earth. But it doesn't matter. If you, chose, you can choose it anywhere you want to. You can choose it at the moon. You're going to si find the same physical point. You know, It's just going to have a different coordinate if you change the coordinate system. So let's choose it. Makes it a little easier. Let's choose it at the, at the center of the Earth. So what's the distance from the origin? This is going to be zero because our origin is at the Earth. So the distance to the center of the Earth is zero. This is going to be the mass of the moon, and this is going to be the 60 Earth radii. Uh, right. And this is the total mass. So we get this, and look at this. What does this result tell us? Where does the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system lie? Inside the Earth. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so it's about three, roughly three quarters of the way. It's right about there. <coughs> Okay, any questions? That's a nice simple example. We'll do similar problems. And I, I, I jumped ahead a little bit. When we have a continuous distribution <coughs> like this, um, what you can do, you don't have to do it for this. There's a way that you can get out of integrating here. And we just don't have time to get into it, but it is written into notes and I'll talk about it in a few minutes. But in general, for the general formalism here, general mathematics, when you have a continuous body, you're going to imagine it cut up, you know, split up into a bunch of little tiny volumes, and you're going to find the moment. The moment of that little, um, in the x direction, the moment of that little bit of mass is going to be its mass, which is the mass per unit volume times the volume times the distance, the signed distance from the, the x value. So you, then you integrate over the whole object. That gives you the total moment. And then you need to divide by the total mass, which is the integral of rho. So you've all done, well, you probably haven't done the calculations like this. What it, but what if rho is uniform? What if it's a constant? Like it is for this. Density is constant here, right? What happens to it? it it's gone from the problem. The calculation becomes purely geometric here. This is, you know, integral calculus. Here it is. And this is a common thing that's done in calculus courses. It was when I took it uh, a few years ago. <laughs> okay, more than a few decades ago. But um, I, I, sometimes I ask students, and I, I, did you guys remember doing this when you took integral calculus? Yeah, it's, a, it's a good thing, too, because it's, it's physical, even though you don't probably understand what's going on there. I mean, wh what the physics of it is. But you now can see, this is going to tell us where the center, the x center of mass is. And it's a purely geometric calculation. You've got to find the total moment in the x direction, and then you divide by the total volume. So we will do some examples of this in this class, in the problem set. OK, any questions so far? or comments. Now, um, so that's analytical. We can analytically determine the center of mass. And at this point, you, you're probably guessing, oh, the center of mass must be important because this guy's spending all this time talking about it. It is important. It's one of, it's, for a system of particles, it's a very important quantity, as we will see. And we'll, see, we'll start to see that today, why it's so important. You don't have to do it analytically. And often when you have an irregular shape, you have to put that on the computer to, do, you, to, uh, to solve for the center of mass if you want to do it theoretically. But there's a simple experimental way to do it. So there's some, this can be any, um, we're imagining to be a rigid body. And let's suppose I support it at a, any point. I pick any point here. And it's in equilibrium, and we're in a gravita yeah, we're in a gravitational field, so it's in equilibrium. So where does the center of mass? Forget this right now. Where does the center of mass have to lie? It's got to lie on this line. It's got to be somewhere along here, right? Because if it weren't, um, well, remember the center of mass is the balance point, and me suspending it here, I can just as well suspend it at the 
you know, instead of here, I can imagine suspending it at the center of mass point. So if the center of mass is over here and I let it go, it's going to rotate this way. If the center of mass is over here, it's going to go this way. It's pretty obvious and we'll prove this later. So the center of mass has to lie somewhere along this line, but I don't know where. However, if I suspend it from another point, as long as it's not this point, <laughs> okay, any other point except this particular point. What's the problem if I suspend it at this point, put it upside down? I'm not gaining any information, am I? The fact that it's in equilibrium at this point tells me it's got to lie somewhere along this line. That's, I'm going to get the same information. So I, want to, I don't want to not take that point. I'd never thought of that before, but it's pretty obvious. So here's a different point. So again, the center mass has to lie somewhere along this line. So we've nailed it down, right? And what people do, but this is experimental. There's going to be some error. So what it's common for people to do is to do a third point just to make sure. So this third one, if we've been accurate, it will pass very nearly through, this, through that point. So that's a way of experimentally determining that. And I've seen people do it. Okay, my, my father is retired from NASA Ames. And he, he was in, really into golf. And he, for a while he was designing putters. And he had them fabricated at the shop at Ames. Probably wasn't supposed to do that, <laughs> right? Don't tell, oh, video. Uh, <laughs> good luck going after him. He's in, in his late 80s. I don't know if you want to go after him. But um, so, well, they did it after hours. I remember him saying that. He made a point to tell me, well, they do it after hours. But still, they're using, you know, federal government machinery, right? <laughs> so he got really into this. And I'll never forget, I was just a little kid, and I, he was suspending this putter, and, and he wanted to find the, he was trying to find the center of mass of the head. This is a little more complicated problem. Actually, no, oh, I'm sorry. He wasn't, he was doing something related to this. He was finding the center of percussion, I think they call it. So in a putter, you want to, um, there's usually, a line on there where you should write, that's actually called the center of percussion. So it's similar to the center of mass. But I'm bringing it up because, um, I wasn't thinking about doing this until right now, but I'm bringing it up because, you know, sometimes these experimental ways, that's going to give you, if you're careful, that gives you sufficient accuracy. And, you know, you don't want to put it on a computer, especially back then when they, you know, the only computer, there were like three computers in the world, back then, <laughs> one at Los Alamos. Right, one of the first was at Los Alamos. So, um, right, so this is you know, something to keep in mind, this experimental way. So let's look at some more demonstrations here. This um, common kind of curiosity or toy thing, here's a, a um, rider on a horse, okay? And it's, the suspension point's gonna be right here. Okay, so where's the center of mass? Where do you think the center of mass is? Well, you can be fooled here. This is pretty light. This is a plastic. You know, the center of mass involves all the mass here, especially there's a lot of mass right there. Okay, so we can find out. Oh, well, it's a little bit blocked from your view there. But so that looks strange, doesn't it? Because we sort of think of the center of mass as being over here somewhere. This should topple over. But where does the center of mass have to be? It's got to be along a line. Where's that line, a vertical line? Where's that line? Well, it's the line, the vertical line that goes through the suspension point. So the center of mass is going to be probably somewhere right around here. And it's being thrown that way because of the heaviness of that, you know, the higher density of that mass. So you guys aren't impressed by this, are you? I don't see. <laughs> but anyway, it does look kind of strange, right? No. Okay, there's uh, more. Oh, here's a, a, a little more politically correct one than this Native American on a horse. It's, it's this. So where's this? This is more extreme even than that. So the center of mass has to lie. Can I, I make this look more impressive here if I, yeah, that's a little better. So the center mass is going to lie somewhere, you know, it's just a little bit to the left here. 
the, all this mass here is light compared to this mass, and it's pushing the center mass just a small amount. All right. <laughs> I, don't, I think it's kind of dramatic. Uh, there's more, and I'm going to change the order here. So this is a classic demonstration. Now, this thing can, of course, pivot here, right, this, this piece of wood. So the fact that it doesn't topple over tells you what about the center of mass. So here's this possible pivot point. The center mass has to lie where? It has to lie to your right of there, right? And if I add mass to it, now you can probably guess what's going to happen. This is enough to push the center of mass to the right and it topples over. Okay. So let's do a, um, it's a similar demonstration. You wonder, well, why did somebody make this? Okay, so the center of mass here, it's got to lie to the le to your right of the of this of this pivot point here, and what's going to happen? No. Oh. So now, what do you infer? This wasn't enough to push the center of mass over the over to the other side. So I've got a center of mass here. When I add this, the center of mass is going to move that way, but it's still to the left to your right of this point here, right? Okay. So let's do it again. So what's going to happen? So the red thing must be not there. So I actually willed that to do that. This is telekinesis. <laughs> it, and it, you know, you didn't see me strain a lot because I've got I had a lot of practice. But in the beginning, I had to really concentrate. You know. <laughs> so what's going on? You think that's you think it's telekinesis? The red piece isn't consistent. Not uniform. It's not uniform. Not uniform. Yeah. In fact, you can see this little kind of look at look at there. There's a weight here, and it's probably metal. It's something denser than the wood. This is wood. So the first time I did it, I carefully had this here, okay? And that, this was designed probably by trial and error, right? It's designed such that this wouldn't, when the, when the weight is there, it's not enough to push it over. But when you, I rotate it, now the weight's here, that's enough to push it over. Clever. Okay, here's another demonstration. So, this, this, you can see the structure here. And where's the center of mass by symmetry? It's going to be along this central axis here. And because we have symmetry this way, it's going to be right at this point, maybe a little lower than this point. But this plumb bob here is goes through the center of mass. All right, the center of mass is going to be right around here by symmetry. Okay, and this is deformable. This was really a good idea. This is really intelligent. But you have to pay for this. <laughs> Unless you want to make your own. See this right here? VV German. Yeah, this was like $100 a quarter, you know, in the 90s, in the early 90s. And I'm not kidding you. So, yeah, most physics instructors know why the German economy is so good. They, they, their scientific equipment is really expensive. Yeah, this was, well, this is probably more than, I don't know what it is now, but it's more than $100. But it is, um, you know, if you've got the money, you're going to buy it. This is a great idea. You can see where this is headed, right? So now you can actually see the center of mass has to be the, to the left of the pivot point here, right? Because the plumb bob, the center of mass is lying, uh, lies at near the top of the plumb bob there. So if I let this go, what's going to happen? It's going to stay there. However, and if I deform it a little more, I don't know if you can see that this is in the way. You think for $100 they wouldn't have that in the way, but they do something, you know? Uh, you can see it right there, right? It's still... Maybe you can see it. It's still to that side of the pivot point, so it's not going to go. But what happens when I put it just slightly, when the center mass is just slightly beyond the axis there? Now I've got it, if you can see it. Now the center mass is going to be slightly beyond, and you know what's going to happen, right? Topples over. 
This is a great idea. Um, we don't have, here's another demonstration. We don't have this one. It was at my previous university and I should have stolen it. But now it's not commercially available. So we have to make, we're gonna have to make this. This is pretty simple. These are plates, uniform plates. Okay, and they have holes in them. And you find the center of mass by static balance, like that method, the experimental method. But we can talk about this theoretically. This is an equilateral triangle of a uniform plate. Where does the center of mass have to be? At the geometrical center, right? And you can see it, you can imagine suspending it here and it's going to lie along there. Here it's going to, it's going to be at the geometrical center. What about, this has high degree of symmetry. What about a semicircular plate? Where does the center of mass have to lie by symmetry? Along this line. But where is it along the line? I think we're going to calculate that in the problem set. You don't know where it is. It's going to be somewhere around here. Here we have no symmetry. You don't know where, you don't know where the center of mass is going to lie. But I'll tell you, and you can probably guess, it's not going to lie in the body in this case, the, the plate. It's going to lie you know, somewhere around here. That's important because uh, high jumpers, I don't know if you guys have heard this before, and I, th I think our book has a picture or a diagram of this, I can't remember. Uh, good high jumpers, the center of mass goes under the bar. Yeah, to clear the kind of heights that competent high jumpers can clear, they can't put their center of mass over the bar, it's humanly impossible. They just don't have the strengths. So part of the art or the athletics of high jumping is to contort your body such that the center of mass is going, you can only raise your center of mass so much and it's not good enough to clear decent heights. So the center of mass, you know, can lie anywhere. And so this is, so what I used to do with this was kind of like put some, uh, <laughs> okay, so you could see wherever the center of mass is that it actually travels. Imagine it going over a bar and it goes underneath. Okay, so here's a classic and I finally looked it up on the internet. I should have done this years ago. Where's the center of mass of the United States? Okay, now we're going to imagine a flat United States. Okay, uniform What's the center of mass of this object, this piece of cardboard here? And there's a big surprise about this that I just learned that I'll just tell you. Well, we can do it by static balance, right? There's some holes in here. So the center of mass, wherever it is, is going to have to lie along this vertical line here. So it looks like it heads to the tip of Florida. So I'm going to draw a vertical line here down, this is real crude. So let's see, does that line look vertical to you? Kind of? Okay, there's another, here's another point somewhere in uh, Michigan. Okay, all right, so it's, I see it as sort of headed this way, so I'm gonna draw a line that way. Now just to confirm, whoever made this found a point in Texas such that the is pretty much upside down, right? Pretty much 180 degrees. Okay, so so they all tend to agree and we, we really need to make a better one of these. We need to get a nice National Geographic map, sandwich it between plates of clear acrylic, cut it out along the, you can't buy this. You know, nobody's gonna, nobody can, you can't buy this. And you know, maybe the Germans have it, but <laughs> to me, Germany is not real interest, not as interesting. <laughs> so anyway, what I see here is something, um, 
it's, a, it's south of the border between Nebraska and Kansas is going to be the center of mass. So I finally, you know, I should have done this a long time ago. So if you go into Wikipedia, the geographic center. So when they say geographic, what they're not telling you, but if you read enough in here and you look closely enough, you can infer that it's assuming that just what we did. It's the center of mass. And at one point in one of these, um, oh, what's the difference here? What's the difference between this one? What's the contiguous United States? That used to be called the continental, which is better to call it contiguous. The states are all touching. This includes Alaska and Hawaii. There's a different, Ala uh, yeah, right, so it's going to be different. But it is really the center of mass, assuming a flat, like for a flat plate that would, that would look like that. And I, I've got, oh, so, and it's, um, it's, we were a little off. It's about 12 miles south of the Kansas-Nebraska border. It's near the town of Lebanon. It's a few miles away from Lebanon, Kansas. And here's the <laughs> really interesting thing. In 1918, the Coast and Geodetic Survey found this location by balancing on a point, by balancing on a point, a cardboard cutout shaped like the United States. So that's what they did. They had a card, just they did what we did a little bit more accurately. Okay. So we need a new, we need a new, you can't buy it, we need to get a nice demonstration of this. And of course there are plaques, you know, this is marked. You can read about this, just go into Wikipedia. Internet and one of them, pardon me? Internet distribution companies like that sell on Amazon, they all have their warehouses in that Wow. Yeah, there's a population center of the, or I don't know what they call it. What do you think that means? So now instead of mass, it's, you know, instead of land, it's people. So you can find a center of mass of people where they live in the United States. So I think that's called the population center of the United States. That might be what it would be, excuse me, that might be what it would be better for a distribution, right? Or, I don't know. So anyway, yeah, they have these, they mark these places. So I was thinking, um, <clears throat> you know, in Texas here, there's gonna, this is going to go near a, some town in Texas. So they could put up a plaque saying that when the United States is suspended from that point, it's upside down. <laughs> it's, it's vertically up, you know, it's, which, I, I don't know if that's, <laughs> that's, it sounds like a negative thing, but I'm okay with that because it's, you know, Texas, but. <laughs> Now, so this is for a flat, what about the different mass distribution, like the Rocky Mountains? What's that going to do to the center of mass? It's going to throw it off, right? So it would be interesting to calculate that. I've never seen a calculation, but it's probably out there. It would be interesting to see how much it throws it off. There's another problem here. Is the Earth flat? No, the United States is bent a little bit. Where's that, what's that going to do to the center of mass? Yeah, so what they should have on this sign, they obviously did not consult a physicist. So where you see this, this marker here, <clears throat> they should say, first of all, it's not right because the Rocky Mountains, probably not, you know. But then they also should give you the depth, right? It's going to be deeper. It should give you the depth. Why didn't they do that? They didn't consult a physicist. <laughs> so why just the Rockies? Why not like the Appalachian Mountains? Why not? Because they're there. Have you ever been seen the Rockies? <laughs> I mean, I live there. So mm -hmm. the Appalachian Mountains. You know, they're old, weary, worn down. <laughs> The Rockies are, yeah, I don't, you know, it'd be interesting. Yeah, right. <laughs> Energetic. <laughs> Very active. There also be a question. Yeah. Professor, there also be a question of like what projection your map, your map comes from. The North United States would be. Oh, yeah. Good point. Yep, good point. Yeah. That's right. I didn't, I didn't think of that. Let me make a note.
Yeah, but with the, okay. the Mercator projection or whatnot, I mean, it's actually... Right, that's what, that's what um, Mitch is talking about. Yeah, there's a potential problem there. Thank you. So here's... So I designed this years ago at my previous university. And of course, I felt I had the right... No, this was actually private, so it wasn't... The state government. So this is stolen from a state government. Does that make any, does that make a difference? Does that make any difference? So it turns out the dimensions, I was really surprised. The dimensions are really simple here. There has a radius somewhere here. It's a center, the geometric center of, the, of six inches. This radius is three inches. And the whole, the center of the hole is offset two inches. So it's nice, nice numbers, right? So the question is, where is the center of mass here? Well, first of all, it's got to be on this symmetrical line. It can't be by symmetry. It's got to be on. It's got to be here. Okay. <clears throat> but the question is, is it inside the hole or outside the hole? That's the question. And you, without doing a calculation, you wouldn't know. Or you could do an experiment. So I don't know if you, can you see this? I'm balancing it on the edge of a meter stick here. And it, the balance point is right around, it's very sensitive because it's unstable. But the balance point is inside the hole. That's what I wanted. And the reason I wanted that is because if I suspend it from here, the center mass is down here, and I perturb it, what's it going to do? It's just going to oscillate, right? Now. What's going to happen when I perturb it? Well, it looks like this. It looks to me like the center mass is up here. So if I perturb it, it's going to slide down. It's unstable. But I just we just showed that the center mass is down here. So what's it going to do? As long as you don't give it a very big amplitude, what it does is it oscillates. I gave it too big of an amplitude. Sorry. So as long as the amplitude is sufficiently small, uh, it's, it's critical on suspending it right at the... Can you see it oscillate there? Yeah, it's pretty dramatic. So if you didn't know what the center of mass was, and you saw this, what information would you get? Where is it? It's got to be below the suspension point. It's got to be down here. And you can, in fact, calculate it. It's a little bit too much for us, so we're going to admit it. But it's actually, uh, it can be calculated here. And you can look at this if you're interested. Um, here's the calculation. And it's about a third of an inch. About a third of an inch down there. And it's interesting how the calculation is done. It can be done without integration, just, uh, but you have to think a little bit. You have to use the principle of superposition. OK. Oh, we're way behind. OK. Uh, so what's the big deal about the center of mass? Well, there's a, it has a number of properties. And the first one, we're going to see the first one. Besides the stuff we've been doing, which is interesting, you know, this balance point stuff. Um, but from a dynamic point of view, here it is. This is a simple derivation. Let's go back to two particles. Here's the center of mass. Okay, let's multiply through by the mass and then take two time derivatives. Well, two time derivatives on the location of the center of mass is going to be the acceleration of the center of mass. Two time derivatives on this is going to be the acceleration of particle one and similarly here. So Newton's second law tells us that the mass times the acceleration of this is going to be the total force on particle one. This will be the total force on particle two. It will be its mass times its acceleration. This total or net force on M1, we can split. We can always split it into two. This is the external force on M1. It might be due to a gravitational field, for example. And we're going to be very general here. We're going to allow an arbitrary situation where mass 2 can exert a force on mass 1. That's an internal force, but it's a, it's, it could be there, right? 
But look what happens when we add these two. So here's the force, net force on mass one, net force on mass two. What is F21 plus F12? Remember Newton's third law? Zero. It's zero. So we end up with the fact that the net force on a system of two particles, but this easily generalizes to any number of particles, is the total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. So the way you want to think of this is, I've got this arbitrary system of particles here. The center of mass moves as if all of this mass is concentrated at the center of mass, and all the external forces are concentrated at that point. That's how we, that's the way you want to think of this. Okay, that's what I put here. And this is not obvious. Suppose this is, a, this is a top view, you have a frictionless table and you have a rod, so you're looking down. So you exert, a, they st they starts from rest, you exert a force here. What's going to happen? It's going to accelerate, right? What if I exert the same rod, but now I exert the force here? What's going to happen? Well, it's going to, yeah, do something, right? It's going to go like this. What's the difference, how is the, what's going to be the difference between these centers of mass? How is this center of mass here going to move in this situation compared to this situation when the force is down here? What do you think? We might think it's going to be less, have less acceleration, right? You're going to get more acceleration here? Uh-uh. And physicists get this wrong. I've stumped many physics professors on this. I probably shouldn't tell you that, but it's true. What's the answer? They both have the same acceleration. They both have the same mass. Right, same rod? Same force. Same force. Imagine all the mass to be concentrated. Both of these centers, in, in both cases, they have, you have to have the same acceleration. It's not obvious. Um, let's do one. Let's do one quick and then we'll call it here. This mallet. Where's the center of mass? Well, it's going to be somewhere along the axis here. See where I put white out here? That's the balance point. All right. If I throw it up in the air, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to go like this, going to rotate and go up. But what's the center of mass going to do? It's just going to go straight up, straight down. It's going to have acceleration g. It's not going to do any of this. And see if you can see this here. I don't know, maybe this is a better background. Well, that was a nice trick. So can you see it? It should go straight up. Everything else is going like this, right? Except at the center of mass, it should go straight up and straight down. And what's, I gave it a little horizontal velocity. What if I have a, throw it this way. What's the path of the center of mass have to be? A parabola, right? So see if you can see this. I've never can see this. Is that, does that, was that convenient? Uh, we're, we're, we got to stop. Okay, so there's another demonstration that's really interesting. We'll do. We'll start off with that tomorrow.